Hey everybody, welcome to The Point. I'm your host, Anna Casper, and you guys should know that by now. And we have a great show ahead for you guys, including a great discussion about censorship in China. I can't wait to talk about that because it involves a penis building. But we're also going to talk about heroism in the beginning of the show and then finish the show with Chris Brown. So it kind of shows you the versatility of this program. But before we get to all of that, let's meet our awesome panelists, many of which you are already familiar with. Uh, Max Lugavier is a longtime TV personality who will soon be launching a new show on AOL, Acting Disruptive, featuring celebrities who challenge the status quo. Now, your first episode features Adrian uh, Gr Gr Grenier. Yeah. <laughs> I love that last name. It's so exotic and beautiful. It but, is. It's pretty exotic. Um, you know what I also love about that name? Tell me. The guy that's attached to it. Uh, so can I get his number, you know? <laughs> yeah, I, I, can, mean, I can hook that up after the show. All right, sounds good, sounds good. I mean, I'm in a relationship, but I can take care of that. Um, all right. <laughs> Dave Rubin wow. is a comedian wow. and the host of the newest TYT network show, The Rubin Report, which you should all check out, especially the most recent episode. I hear that you had a really, really great panel. I had the most fantastic panelist ever. Have you heard of this Anna Kasparian girl? I have. <laughs> she was sensational. You also had um, Elaine. And Elaine Boozler. Who's amazing. Great comedian. Yeah. She made fun of me throughout the entire episode, which I loved. So you guys. She's a bit of an out. ageist. She thinks <laughs> she thinks you're awfully young, which I don't take as a, a, a huge uh, criticism. So that's okay. Um, Desi Doyen is the co-host uh, with husband Brad Friedman of the nationally syndicated radio show The Green News Report. That is, she used to be until we here at TYT decided to like <laughs> steal her and have her on like every show that we have. Well, you know, you guys are just awesome. I can't help it. Yeah. Well, thank you for joining us. It's always a pleasure to have you guys on the program. Now let's get right to our discussion, we want to talk about heroism. Now there's been a lot of talk about heroism after uh, Charles Ramsey uh, saved the three women that were held captive uh, by this hideous, hideous man, Ariel Castro. And of course, there was also a lot of talk about um, you know, whether or not you should be considered a hero if you come out uh, as a major athlete who's gay. Now let's watch a quick video that explains a little more about this. Let's turn to Jason Collins. Um, it, this is the uh, sports star that came out. Uh, you tweeted this, so Jason Collins is a hero because he's gay. Our standard for heroism has dropped quite a bit since Normandy. Why such a cheap shot against a guy who did a pretty brave thing? I don't think it's a cheap shot. I think that heroism is defined by willingness to sacrifice uh, in favor of, and take a real personal risk in favor of a, of a noble larger goal. This may be a noble larger goal, but I'm he's not the sure first, what the risk the first male American athlete in history to come out as gay while still playing. If you've been watching the news at all over the past 24 hours, you know that a star has been born. A man named Charles Ramsey from Cleveland. And last night he was very busy eating a Big Mac when he heard a woman screaming from inside his neighbor's house. <laughs> he rushed over, he kicked the door in and freed her. It turned out she'd been missing for 10 years and there were two other women in the house who'd also been missing. It's a terrible story, but thanks in part to Charles Ramsey, everyone is now safe and out of the house and Charles is being hailed as a hero. <laughs> All right. It'd be a fascinating way to end the video. <laughs> I love it. Um, now, recently, Angelina Jolie also came to the public and said that she had a double mastectomy, and a lot of people were saying that she was heroic for talking about a very personal decision that she made for her health. Desi, I want to start off with you with this whole question of heroism. I mean, do you think that Angelina Jolie is a hero? And if so, or if not, I mean, how do you define heroism? Well, I think that's a great way to start, is how do you define it? I mean, I think generally we all have sort of a, an idea of what it means without actually stopping and thinking about it. And so you made me stop and think about it. It's like, well, I think what it is is it's, you know, when you do something that is selfless, that helps someone else, does not help yourself in any fashion, it's also something that is at great personal risk to yourself. And I think the guy that was on the video where he called it, you know, it's in service of a noble, large, goal, but somehow a lot of people seem to believe that heroism has to involve physical risk of your life. But I think with Jason Collins specifically coming out, as a professional gay male athlete, the first one. That was at great personal risk to his livelihood. And I think that life and livelihood are you know, two things that can also be considered part of that definition. So I absolutely think Jason Collins is a hero. He's a hero to a lot of people for being the first one to do this. Angelina Jolie, not so much. I think that she's a great role model. I think what she did was very courageous, but I wouldn't necessarily call it 
um, her being a hero for this because she's already uh, basically set for life and it's not necessarily going to be as much at great personal risk to her life or livelihood uh, you know for her to have come out like this it's great what she did don't get me wrong right but I don't know if it would fall under my definition of hero see and I like that you say my definition of hero because it really does differ from one person or another In I the mean eye of the beholder it, it, really that's the, that is the case and like when I think of heroes not to get too schmoopy here like I think about my mom you yeah. know like that's my hero exactly. right but but to everyone else they're like that's just your mom it doesn't mean anything right and when I think of heroes I think of spider-man so <laughs> everybody but we should be clear there's a difference between being bitten by a radioactive spider and then yeah. saving the world and then just regular people what a re what a real hero is is someone who steps up to the moment right. so Charles Ramsey he was there were many people that probably had little indications of things he stepped up to his moment he now has his defining moment and saved these women's lives Jason Collins yes Maybe he's going to retire, maybe he wasn't the greatest player, but he stepped up to his important moment. And that's what a hero is, in my view. Yeah, I mean, I think that the opposite of heroism is apathy. And, you know, I, like, I think that, you know, Angelina Jolie definitely needed to do what she did, but she could have just kept it private. You know, she easily could have uh, somehow. And I think that for her to sort of ignite the national conversation about the need of double, you know, voluntary double mastectomies with when you have this gene. Uh, I think it's great, you know. I mean, so many people sit idly by and do nothing with their with their platforms, you know, especially in the world of celebrity. Or they and do uh, something extremely generic, like they'll find yeah. some charity that they can attach their name to. I mean, would you consider that heroic if it's like, oh, well, I got to do something philanthropic, so sure, uh, I want to fight for women who are victims of domestic yeah, abuse. Yeah, I mean, I think as long as it's an authentic effort, you know, mm -hmm. it can't just be lip service, mm -hmm. you know. Um, there was a, one of my favorite movies of the past year is, is The Dark Knight Rises, and at the end of The Dark Knight Rises, there's an amazing quote that Batman says about heroism. He said, a hero can be anybody, even somebody putting a coat reassuring a young child that the world hasn't ended. I mean, it's really, it's all relative, you know, and, uh, and I think that the, this definitely goes for people with platforms. Yeah, know? it's not just about acts. It's not just about running into a burning building. It's about the moment. We all are going to have some moment in your life where you can do, be better than yourself, and that is what a hero is. Would you consider uh, our soldiers heroes? Uh, I know that Chris Hayes made controversial statements when he said, you know, well, you can't really, they're not really considered heroes. And of course, he had to backpedal from that a little bit because he got a lot of hate. So I know I'm putting you guys in the hot seat right now by asking you this very difficult question. But Dave Rubin, I want to start off with you. Do you think that if you join the military, that automatically makes you a hero? Can I wait till they give their answers <laughs> and then I'll just parse between them? Um, I would say, yes, they're heroes in that they are doing something benevolent to protect our freedoms. And it's not worth getting into all the politics of whether we invade countries we should. They don't make all those decisions. They are trying to do something good, something that does and pay a lot that they're not going to get a lot of benefits from in the rest of their lives and I think in that regard they they are heroes. Desi can you have a checkered past and still be a hero now in the specific case of Charles Ramsey um, people started looking into his past and they're like mm, turns out he was a bit of a criminal and they're trying to belittle what he had done and do you think that that takes away from his good act uh, I think absolutely you can be a hero with a checkered past and absolutely it takes away from what he did for people to I think the media looking for something else to just keep the story going are digging into somebody's past and they're not doing it because he did such a great thing they're doing it because they just need to fill some time yeah. mm -hmm. um, I think what Charles Ramsey did was heroic because many people in an urban area many people would just you know be apathetic or would not try to get in or get involved remember there was a huge uh, terrible uh, episode that happened in New York in the 70s where a woman who was being raped and murdered in an, uh, in her neighborhood and she called called out for help you know, over a period of like a half hour and nobody came out to help her. Mm -hmm. So that would be the opposite of heroism. So what he did by stepping up and getting those women out when he didn't have to, I think absolutely means that he can be a hero in that situation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. totally. So uh, Max, is there a specific case where you felt that you, know, you could really rise to the occasion and be a hero? Me? Uh, yeah, on, I mean, uh, what do you got? <laughs> well, I think every, day to day, every day is sort of a hero's journey, you know, on the individual scale for each of us. So I think that it's like, you know, whether it's donating to a, a Kickstarter campaign here and there that you find to be really sort of um, meaningful or, 
you know, voting with your, with your wallet at the supermarket and going with, you know, a meat product that's from an organic, natural, small farm as opposed to, like, Monsanto. I think that that's, you know, a micro act of heroism that should be respected, you know? Yeah, I love the de different definitions of hero. I'll give you guys a specific example of where I felt that I was a hero. Um, because I know that, you know, tooting my own horn is something the audience <laughs> loves. That's very uh, heroic, by the way. Yes, yes. <laughs> I remember when we were in Vegas once, uh, the line for the buffet was insanely long, and this huge group of people just cut everyone and I lost it and I really spoke up and uh, someone who worked at the buffet told them no back of the line Ooh. and you know what I think that that was pretty damn heroic wow. <laughs> especially in Vegas <laughs> exactly right you're hungry you're hungover yeah. I'm obviously joking around um, but it is totally <laughs> true I mean there are so many little acts that people can do that really have such a huge influence on people and and I love that I love that you know they do get credit for what they do especially in the case of Charles Ramsey you guys are absolutely right there were so many cases in that particular story where people suspected something but they didn't really investigate it and you know he put himself in a situation that could have been risky I mean I remember he said you know you know there's something wrong when a pretty little white girl, you know, is, is trying to run into the arms of a black man, right? So he, it seemed like he had his hesitation in the beginning, but he did something that he felt was right, and it saved three lives. And wasn't the beauty of him, like, there was such honesty in him? Like, the way he did those interviews, there yeah. was nothing pretentious or about me. He was so right. matter-of-fact. I was having my McDonald's, yeah. and I just did this thing that anyone would do, and that's what a hero is. Yes, definitely. So, um, it is... Being a hero is something that people are born with, or would you say that it's something that is learned? There's this whole nature versus nurture argument when it comes to heroism. Max, let me start off with you. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think, I think moment to moment people have the opportunity to make heroic choices, and I don't, I don't think you have to be born with it. I think it's just, you know, I think it's kind of in our DNA, you know, to, mm -hmm. to, to do the right thing. I don't think you need any sort of you know, outside influence. Interesting, Desi. Well, I think one of the things that, uh, that you do find is that when we have the, uh, the society that we have, the culture that we have, you know, we, we talk to kids from a very young age, you know, they've got Sesame Street, they have comic book characters, they have superheroes. We're constantly presenting to them in our societal mythology, if you want to call it that. Hey, you know, these are the ways that, that you get along great. These are sort of our culture. You know, you try to help other people. You try to be selfless and unselfish when you can. So I don't know that it's innate. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, we do sort of train each other and talk to each other about these things. And they see that, you know, good things happen when you help people. So that's yeah. the training from childhood. But also there is some, when, you, when, you're, when you're going through, say, military, uh, training that they do say you never know how you're going to react when the moment uh, you are required to step up when that happens and that's why they train them so hard so that they can behave instinctively and not have to stop and think about it so it's you know we don't really know how any one of us would react when presented with that situation and we can you know pretty much hope that we will behave in a way that we'll be glad we did later yeah <laughs> I, well, I was going to say, you know, there's that sort of biblical quote of do unto others, and I'm not religious at all, but I think that there's a scientific uh, basis for that. We all have mirror neurons, and I think that that provides us sort of a, you know, a scientific basis for empathy, you know, and people, you know, I think like they've, they've shown that psychopaths, like the person that kidnapped these three girls, mm -hmm. you know, they have, chances are he's super low on the empathetic scale, you know, he has like faulty mirror neurons or something like that. I think we, I think we're hardwired to, to treat people properly and I think you know where there's faults in that you know wiring that's when we have monsters like the guy in Cleveland. Well later on in the show we're going to talk about Elizabeth Warren uh, proposing her first Senate bill and uh, in that Senate bill she's going to uh, attempt to lower the interest rate for federal student loans and and the reason why I'm bringing that up in this segment is because Elizabeth Warren is an example of a hero to me because she's actually using her position as a politician to help the public right so um, you know in, in mentioning who my hero is I was hoping that maybe you guys can share who you consider to be your hero. Well, it's interesting, you know, mm -hmm. I was thinking about that when you, you know, about that idea. And, you know, there's a difference between role models. I think there's like a spectrum. There's role models all the way up to heroes. Mm -hmm. So like you, my mom is my hero because yeah. she went through great personal sacrifice mm -hmm. to uh, be who she is today and where she is today. And that was uh, through a lot of difficult circumstances. So because of that, because of my personal connection to her and knowing those circumstances, uh, that's why she's my hero. And, and more so when I look at people in the culture, uh, people in politics or people who are heroes outside of myself it's more about look at that action that they took that great personal risk to themselves that that is a, a different kind of heroism all right Dave Rubin 
Well, my mom, of course. Yeah. You ha have to say mom. Yeah, uh, no, all and, of us and, have to say mom, Yeah, right? all mothers <laughs> everywhere. Desi's mom, no. your mom. Um, but in, in another way, I would say Ellen DeGeneres, because oh, after she yeah. came out and she did her first stand-up special as an out person, and we had known her one way for 20 years, it, it was so eye-opening, and that I saw this other person that I identified with because of comedy, who uh, was stepping up and doing something that I felt like I should have been doing for so long, and that special just opened my world, and yeah, it was pretty heroic. That's a great answer, yeah. Max. Well, God, I, my, my parents, my mom, and my mom, you know, is definitely an amazing woman, uh, and you know, I don't know, they they were just awesome parents, and I know it's difficult uh, to be a good parent and to uh, provide. You know, for your kids, especially like my parents, their marriage wasn't you know that great, but they stayed together and they they raised me and my two brothers really well. And so I don't know. All right, fair yeah. enough. Everyone loves their parents. That's a good thing. We got we got a solid maybe, maybe panel loving Day people. Yeah, mom. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, exactly. Mom. All right. Well, that does it for our first segment. We got to take a very very quick break. When we come back, more great stories, uh, including what I just uh, referenced, Elizabeth Warren and uh, her first Senate bill. Stick around. The Associated Press says that the U.S. Justice Department has been secretly monitoring them for over two months. During that time, the DOJ collected telephone records of reporters and editors at the AP. The Associated Press called this, quote, a massive and unprecedented intrusion into how news organizations gather the news. The government would not say why it sought those records, however. But U.S. Just, uh, U.S. officials have previously said in public testimony that the U.S. attorney in Washington is conducting a criminal investigation into who may have leaked information contained in an AP report on a failed uh, terror plot. Now, there are many scandals that the Obama administration is dealing with right now. And, of course, uh, this huge Department of Justice scandal um, is getting a little bit of attention uh, when you compare it to the amount of attention Benghazi is getting. But I think that this is a really fascinating story because it's a case where, for the first time, the mainstream media is getting a little taste of what American civilians have been dealing with since 9-11. You have the government spying on you, and it turns out the AP doesn't like it so much, Dave. Yeah, well, uh, to loosely quote Ben Franklin, those who give up freedom for security deserve neither, and this is the most obvious case of that. And of course, the media is now upset because it's their phones, you know. The Department of Justice already has said they can go into our emails and our Facebook messages and our Twitter DMs. I mean, they already can do that, and yet we don't talk about that. That didn't cause an uproar which is far greater uh, in terms of uh, security issues and, and personal privacy and all that kind of stuff. It is great that the media is finally on board with this, and that's why the AP, the president of the AP, his email, uh, the public email that he sent out after this was so, uh, it was over the top in its anger, actually, mm -hmm. because they want this to get to critical mass. And yes, we may think Obama is a good guy, but they cannot get away with this kind of stuff. No, and, and uh, look, especially when it comes to civil liberties, foreign policy, Obama has not been a great guy. And I think that the mainstream me media has failed at being critical of him. I know that on our own show, on The Young Turks, when we're overly critical of Obama, a lot of our supporters are like, no, 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 you can't do that. You can't criticize uh, the Democratic Party. Yes, you can. You're supposed to hold your politicians accountable, regardless of which political party they're affiliated with. Um, but in this case, I mean, even though I, I think that the Associated Press is being hypocritical in not criticizing the Obama administration for doing warrantless wiretaps like, like the Bush administration did, um, I do see this as a huge problem because of the fact that it destroys freedom of the press. And it also basically intimidates whistleblowers. What do you think, Max? Yeah, no, I think that it's totally messed up. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think the press needs to sort of feel like they're operating you know, in a, with free license to report on what they want and when they want, and they should definitely be able to be critical of the government. And I think that, like, you know, as an intimidation tactic, uh, that, you know, this is going to really sort of work to sway them, you know, in a, in a different direction. Well, it definitely has a chilling effect, yeah. uh, not only for the press themselves to know that they are in very real danger of having their uh, sources, all of their investigations, everything that they're doing is a way of, oh, oh, look, they're going to look over here, so let's try to stop them at the pass here. That's something that right. the government can do, but especially for the whistleblowers in the government, because that is primarily the way that we get information about what is happening and really happening. 
happening in the government. You know, we're not China. We don't live by what the, comes out on the press release. Right. We actually try to find out what's happening behind the scenes, what's really going on with these people. And this is the real problem. This is a very serious deal. Yeah, it really is, especially when you consider the treatment of Julian Assange and, and how desperately the U.S. wants to prosecute him. You know, it's just, it's, it's all about intimidation, if you ask me. Go ahead, yeah. Dave. Well, this isn't about whether you think government is fundamentally good or bad, you know, right. because the idea of this, of course, you want, if there's some sort of security issue where we want to stop Al-Qaeda from doing something and we have to figure out where it came from, so on its face, that sounds like, oh, well, that's very legit, then the government should know about that. But once you open that door, it's a Pandora's box of what the government can and can't be listening to and why they can and can't. And unfortunately, people are so uneducated that it yes. does the, the, the debate about this never gets to that level of what power really is. That's what we're really talking about here, is power and who should challenge it and, and why. And also, I think a scary thing about this is that, you know, most of this will likely, it seems on first read, of course, we're still finding out a lot about what's actually going on, but a lot of it seems like it might actually be legal what they did because the powers are so broad yeah. that the Bush administration and now the Obama administration, the powers are so broad that they have claimed for themselves that we actually may not find that these have any kind of illegality at all. Now there does appear to be something that they may have violated their own regulations when it comes to the subpoenas for, the, for telephone records. You know, they're supposed to notify the media company unless of course it would compromise the investigation, very broad. Mm -hmm. And also they're supposed to keep it as narrowly drawn as possible. And I think that we can look at, you know, regardless of what the government's uh, justification for the subpoena was, that we can look at it and say, yeah, this was, uh, this was a wide dragnet that they passed through here. That should definitely be a violation of the regulation to make it narrowly drawn. Yeah, I see this as a, the destruction of democracy because we're supposed to have a system of checks and balances and the media is supposed to play a role in that system. They're supposed to held, hold politicians accountable. And if the government has such broad power and has the ability to intimidate the media in this type of way, way that destroys the power of the media and it's a disaster. Now Dave, do you see this as a turning point uh, when it comes to uh, the violation of privacy? Now that the Associated Press has been attacked in this way, do you think that they're, you know, they're going to start pushing for more protections for privacy? Yeah, I think we've had two moments with Obama that have sort of turned things. First was the Rand Paul drone uh, filibuster. That really got the libertarians to go, oh, maybe this, something's not right here. And now this, and because, as I said earlier, because this is about the media, the media, if they love one thing, it's the media. We're all the media, so, you know, uh -huh. I say that with a grain of salt. I say that with a grain <laughs> of salt. You save someone at a buffet, so, yeah, you know. There you go. Um, but yeah, the media will not let something happen directly to them. This is fine. I mean, you can see it very clearly on Twitter. Everybody that works at BuzzFeed and Politico, and every, they're all on this for the first time. They've let everything slide with Obama, but finally they found a cause that they're all going to rally behind. And and I think it's a great thing. Yeah. All right, we got to transition over to Elizabeth Warren, so let's do that. Elizabeth Warren is looking out for students. Let's take a look. $27,000, that's the average amount student loan borrowers that graduate end up owing, $27,000. But the interest rate on federal student loans is set to double this summer if Congress does not do anything about it. Enter Democratic Senator Elizabeth Warren. She has introduced a bill that would give a steep temporary discount, taking the interest rate from 3.4% to under 1%. Tell me more about this bill. Why under 1%? Why not just keep it where it is? Well, look, the bottom line is that every day the United States government lends money to big financial institutions. They've been doing it for years now. They've been doing it at about three quarters of 1%. That's been the interest rate. We have students who are out there borrowing money to get an education, working hard. My view is if the American taxpayer is going to invest in those big financial institutions by giving them a great deal on their interest rate, let's invest in those students by giving them the same deal. Nope. That's what it's about. Now, Elizabeth Warren has worked with MoveOn.org to get this petition rolling, and more than 300,000 people have signed the petition, which means that it does have a significant amount of support. Um, and also, I love the way that she framed this issue, because you compare student loans to the loans that these big banks got when they destroyed our economy. So Max, uh, first question goes to you. I mean, I know I just uh, stated why it's a good idea, but what do, you, <laughs> what do you think? Do you think this is a good idea? Yeah, I, th I think it's a great idea. I mean, I have friends that are drowning in student debt, um, and you know, they're a few years out of college, and I, I just think that like, 
Obviously, you're not comparing apples to apples because there's a lot less risk involved when the government loans to big corporations that have you know, regular income. And people that come out of college, you know, their, their prospects aren't as guaranteed. Uh, but I do think that like education is something that we need to value and promote uh, as a nation. And yeah, you know, it's it's still one, you know, one percent. The government is still is still making money from it. You so know? let me jump in about what you said when it comes to risk. Uh, student loan debt is literally the only debt that you cannot get rid of, even if you file for bankruptcy. So no matter what, throughout your entire life, you will be forced to pay back that loan. So there's very little risk, and banks know that. The federal government knows that. I just read an article today indicating that the Obama administration made 51 billion billion dollars on uh, student loan debt interest uh, you know last year alone and that's a big problem because look the government is loaning out the money and I totally understand why there is a need for that but the government should not be making money off of these students that are drowning in student loan debt. I totally agree. Yeah. You know, but also remember that the banks are also these are taxpayer guaranteed loans so these are a completely risk-free loan for the bank middlemen who are actually administering these loans so they get the interest rate they have no incentive whatsoever to agree with Elizabeth Warren on this you know this is part of the long-term privatization of the cost of college you know, it did not used to be this way for anybody who was coming up before the year 2000. You know, in 2005 is when they changed the rules, making it so that you could not discharge your student loan in bankruptcy. And student loans are the second highest level of consumer debt mm -hmm. in the United States after your mortgage. Your mortgage you can discharge in bankruptcy, I think. Yes, but you your can. student loan you cannot. So this is definitely a lot of hands all in the same pot trying to profit off of students and off the privatization. I don't think there's a whole lot of incentive for these groups to agree with Elizabeth Warren, although I absolutely think she's completely right. I definitely uh -huh. agree she's right, and I can totally see why the groups wouldn't want to agree with them, agree with her. You know, they're looking out for their own interests. Uh, Dave Rubin, I mean, do you see this as a, a good fix, a good solution, or do you see this as a temporary fix? Um, well, it's probably temporary if she gets it to go through, but this is, this is the most important thing that we can possibly be doing. Education is simply, for every other reason, of every other topic that we discuss, on the point, you have to, it needs the legs of education under it. And if we can give 500 million as we did this week to Syrian rebels and we don't know what side they're on, if we can find that money and we can give money all over the world to everyone, other, every other country, I'm pretty sure we can figure out how to do this. This is, this is about politics, not the money, because they always find the money and we're always willing to go more into debt to do crazy things. Mm -hmm. So this is about politics and whether we want to keep people educated or not. I hope we do. Absolutely. I think that this is the single most important issue that you can focus on if you want to better the lives of young people. Right now, they're basically indentured servants. Okay, I was, I was having a discussion with J.R. Jackson, uh, legendary producer of the Young Turks, and you know, he was telling me that he will have to pay off his student loans or pay his student loans until he's 60. Yes. Until he's 60. And so th comparing it to a mortgage is a great way of framing it because you pay your mortgage for 30 years. It's very similar with a student loan. Yeah, and you know, this has very important long-term economic consequences for the country. When you have essentially anyone who's in their 20s and younger is going to be committed to essentially debt slavery mm -hmm. up until their 50s and 60s, that means they're not going to be able to afford to buy a house mm -hmm. because they won't be able to afford that mortgage. They won't be able to have children because they will have to spend so much of their, their monthly pay to service this debt in the past. So I think we have long-term economic issues that, that I think that we need to address, and this is one of the ways that we can do it. But this is, again, only a temporary fix. It is. Dave? Oh, I'm sorry, Max, go ahead. Well, no, I mean, I think that while we're on the topic, it is worth bringing up, at least for a little while, the utility of college in general, because I think that, they, that she, you know, obviously I'm definitely in favor of, of her initiative. But uh, there was an amazing op-ed in the New York Times recently by Thomas Friedman called need a job, invent it. And it was all about how colleges really, what they, you know, they're so built upon the idea of providing students knowledge, but not so much um, in getting students to think critically and be innovation minded, because that's really what's gonna build the foundation of the economy of tomorrow. And, uh, and you know, so I think that like, over the long term, I'm not sure, you know, unless college sort of pivots to adjust to just the exponential rate at which things are changing all around us day by day, uh, if students are even going to need that in the long term. Yeah. One thing that I will say is that you know it, it is really important to teach 
college students or high school students that your decisions in college will impact you for the rest of your life. So, you know, when I was in high school, I remember the counselors telling you, just go to college. Even if it's for a, a major that isn't going to get you anywhere, just go to college, <laughs> right? So I remember like women's studies, Pan-African yeah. studies, all of those topics are interesting and you can learn about that stuff for free online, right? As long as you go to the right sources. Um, but at the same time, you got to do a cost-benefit analysis before you take out the loans and before you decide what you're going to study when you are in college. Exactly. I'm not sure if today, you know, majoring in something like that is worth the $120,000 that you're going to have to pay off for 10 years after college or whatever that is, you yeah. know, like. But also the whole experience of college is important. I would have never been as pro-weed as I am now had I not smoked that much <laughs> weed in college. Right. So there are, there are real world <laughs> applications that you know, it makes you critically think. Yeah, but Max makes a good point. You know, is a college degree necessary? Does the college, will the college industry, and I call it an industry on purpose, will the industry change in time to meet how people are changing and, and students are changing now? But right now, if you look at the want ads, you can't get a receptionist job without a Bachelor of Arts. And I think that that's a societal issue too. Sure. I think that this emphasis on a college degree for like low skilled jobs is ridiculous, right? Like we need to stop with that. And, and I get it, there's a lot of competition, especially when the economy right. is bad and there are so few jobs. But at the same time, I think that it's important for employers to not focus solely on where someone got their education or whether or not they got a college education. Focus on their experience and what kind of skills they can bring to the table. Look, Zuckerberg dropped out of college. Yeah. Uh, there's a zillion, uh, Bill yeah. Gates dropped out of college. I think they're doing all right. Well, that's what I'm saying, knowledge is ubiquitous. Like you have all of the world's knowledge on your iPhone in your pockets right now I and mean, it's yeah. like crazy you know so the another you know what that article said essentially was that it's not so much in creating the economy of tomorrow it's not so much what you know but what you can do with what you know you absolutely know? I mean look I got my master's degree and I ended up here so <laughs> getting an education doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna get so far anyway stick around and when we come back a fun segment about penis buildings in China and Chris Brown is he a douchebag some might call it artwork, while others are calling it an eyesore. Singer-performer Chris Brown has upset many neighbors over what they're calling monster graffiti at his Hollywood Hills home. Dozens of neighbors are outraged over what they claim is his latest attempt to upset his neighbors. Negri says since Brown moved into the stunning four-story Hollywood Hills home, he throws loud parties, speeds through the neighborhood, and now paints a mural on his walls. LA City Councilman Tom LaBanche says it's against the city's ordinance for unpermitted and excessive signage. So now Brown's being cited. All right. I mean, there's really not much else to say about that story. Uh, Dave, it seems like Chris Brown just loves to go around making friends with everyone. That's like his specialty. But what do you think? Do you, can you consider that artwork? I want to be very, very clear about this. Chris Brown is the worst human being on earth today. Mm -hmm. Not Bashar al-Assad, not Kim Jong. He is just... Does he need any more bad PR? Like, what is he possibly, these people in the hills, they don't want regular people just even walking by their houses, much less painting goblins and Pac-Man ghosts yeah. on their, he's just awful. Like, he really, like, how, what could he do? What could he do that would be? I, I, don't, I don't even want to think what he could do <laughs> to make, let's, let's not give him any ideas. I mean, I think he's got the taste of a 12-year-old, which probably goes along with, apparently, his emotional maturity yeah, exactly. of a 12-year-old, so yeah. I'm not surprised that he thought that this was a great idea. And if he is doing that, to annoy his neighbors, you know, you gotta wonder about somebody who does that. You know, who does that? Yeah, I know. I, I look. I totally agree that he's a bad guy. There's no question about that. But at the same time, I mean, don't you kind of want to support the artwork on his house? Like, I feel like does I, he have like, another side on that wall? How about do it on that side? Okay, is it a two-sided wall? Enough. I just, by the way, he's gonna get cited for that. Yeah. Um, and the city has already contacted him and said, look, you got to get rid of that because there are really strict rules when it comes to what color you can paint your house, whether or not you mow your lawn, all of that. But those kinds of laws kind of get under my skin. And I know that they have it because they want to make sure that property values stay up. If you have shitty looking houses in the neighborhood, then your property value is going to go down. But at the same time, like how do you define what's beautiful and what's ugly, right? That's not attractive to me, and I guess most people don't think it's attractive, but maybe that's something that's very attractive to him and that's what he wants on his house. Well, I think that's why they have the city ordinance, because yeah. then it's not supposed to be reliant upon any one person's definition of art. You can say, look, we're just not yeah. going to have murals in the city. No murals on private property. That is the ordinance in Los Angeles. And it, it's partly to, to prevent uh, tagging. 
you know, because there's yeah. a big problem with graffiti in LA and it's Not costs a lot Hollywood of money. Hills, though. Not <laughs> in Hollywood Hills, though. Not in Hollywood Hills, but there is, yeah. you know, I can see what, you know, they're, they're trying yeah. to make it so that everybody gets the same, gets applied, gets the law applied to them in the same way. Yeah. So I can understand that as well. You know, if it's, I think they're going a little bit overboard, obviously. You know, this is not the worst thing in the world. Yeah. So, Max, uh, do you think that this is an example of celebrity entitlement? <laughs> kind of. I mean, you know, he's not exactly being subtle with his uh, <laughs> his affection for um, for street art. You know, I think that I definitely would qualify it as art. I mean, they're they're cool drawings, but I think you know, it's it's upsetting the neighborhood. He's got to be mindful of that. Right. Um, he probably throws parties all the time. I think they said that. Like, I you know. I've, Never been to one of them, so I, I don't know. But um, you know, they were saying that it's upsetting the children of the neighborhood. They're freaked out. They're having nightmares about the drawings because they have huge fangs. And you know, I think that that's worth taking into account. Like, if he has like any sense of empathy in him, which you know, it's mm -hmm. doubtful that he does. But yeah, I mean, just take it, take it down. How much more money and press does this guy need? Right. I think that's what this is really. It's about the never-ending hole that is his soul. That's yeah. what's going on here. It's just this well of nothingness. So he just has to keep acting out in these crazy, bonkers ways. Normal people do not do these things. But think about this. Like, I always wonder if it's just because he was born an asshole or if it's because yeah. society <laughs> made him an asshole, right? Because he did something horrendous, OK? He beat up Rihanna. I mean, I remember those pictures like I saw them yesterday, right? Yeah. With the bumps on her head. It was ho horrible, right? But he didn't really suffer any real consequences for it. I mean, she went back to him. Um, there were people defending what he did. They're like, well, Rihanna was a bitch, so that's uh -huh. why. It, I mean, it was incredible. When yeah. that story played out the way it did, I couldn't believe it. And at the same time, I'm sure he's in his own little celebrity bubble where he's told he's talented. He makes a ton of money. He has songs where he's like making fun of people who are crying from outside of the club because they can't even get in. Like, that's like, that's, that's, his, that's his whole thing. He's constantly being rewarded. So can you blame him for acting out the way that he is? He does get a lot of attention for he it. He does. He's making paper. You know? Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm referencing that lyrics. Means money, I think. <laughs> I'm referencing, <laughs> I'm referencing <laughs> lyrics, and everyone's like, what is she paper? talking what? about? <laughs> I just think he's an idiot. You know, he could have all the money in the world, but he can't buy class. Yes, I love that. Um, you know. There was a Real Housewife of New York who had a song called Money Can't Buy You Class, and I just really? remember that. Yeah, wow. Money can't buy you class. <laughs> and it is so true. And there's nothing classier than a Real Housewife, so, you know. Totally, totally. And, you know, it's an important learning moment for everybody. Absolutely. <laughs> now, just to be 100% clear before we leave this topic, I am playing devil's advocate uh, with this story. I think he is horrible, and he should respect his neighbors. You're living in this area. Uh, people are expecting peace and quiet, you know, keep it down with the parties. But I'm willing to defend him a little bit when it comes to artwork. <laughs> All right, moving from one colossal dick to another, uh, <laughs> we have a story Damn. that's causing uh, a lot of hard feelings in China. Let's take a look. This building, erected in China, proves the country has questionable architecture taste and just plain no sense of humor. Hey, y'all, it's David Begnall, and this is Newsbreaker. So the independent reporting censors in China doing their best to block social media sites where users are poking fun at the new headquarters for the state-controlled newspaper, The People's Daily. It's under construction, and people think it looks a whole lot like that certain part of the male anatomy. The Atlantic reports users on Weibo, China's equivalent of Twitter, are working around the censors by sticking to double entendres like this one. It seems The People's Daily is going to rise up. There's hope for the Chinese dream. Pick of the building going viral, meanwhile. Not the first time, though, China's architecture has been mocked. News anchor Dan Lewis points out on Twitter that China's new Gate of the Orient was ridiculed because it looked like a pair of underpants. Yeah, underpants or something else. I love it. So people are, um, you know, obviously amused by this. And I think it's hilarious that there's a building in China that looks like a dick when China <laughs> has banned uh, pornography and had banned pornography in the 1940s, right? So people are like freaking out over it. Of course you expect the juvenile reaction. I should note though um, that the building isn't completed yet. So the, what you see at the top, which looks like the tip of a penis, uh, is really scaffolding. So who knows what it's really going to look like when it's finally done. I was going to say, at least it's circumcised. <laughs> if they had a Less giant, prone to uh, certain infections. Yeah, if they had a giant fountain at the top of that thing, now that. Now oh that. my <laughs> god. No, I love these pictures. They're hilarious. People so, playing with it, yeah. So in China, you can't get like human Human porn, but you can get building porn, <laughs> um, and people are like, you know, losing it in their pants over D it. Doesn't this just well. show that if you don't give people regular porn, they will do, they will build giant penises. This is why you need porn because it lets people get that out instead of having to walk around and oh, look at that penis and that vagina building and. 
<laughs> we're a horny species. <laughs> we are a horny species. Yeah. And once you tell people, like, you can't have sex, you can't think about sex, you can't even look at a woman's uh, anatomy, right? People lose it. They find ways to do it. Um, I was having a discussion with a coworker who um, had gone to Iran, and he's like, look, I was there for a few weeks, and honestly, after, like, the third week, I would see, like, a woman's ankle, and I would get excited, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, and, like, that was a really interesting thing for him to admit. Um, but it's totally true. When you make something so taboo, people will think about it and people will want it all the time. Yeah, it's a function of repression, you know, that you'll find people have to act out or find ways to act out in strange ways. I don't know that this is necessarily what's going on. I could uh -huh. see it as just being a big oversight, you know, if I had not known yeah. what the photo was before I saw it because of the tweets that were letting you know that this is what you're going to see. I don't know that I would have thought of that immediately. Oh, come How, on, that's a I, penis. It's hard that to is say. a big wooden you think penis. it's hard to say you know there are some people that I've talked to who you know when they first saw it they didn't know what was there. like oh yeah there's a building you know it didn't really yeah. occur to them so it's it maybe it's women. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do we know what's going to be housed in the penis building do we know what kind of the, offices the and the building? state to the state uh, media right. state and that's paper. it so yeah. it's just the state media there's not going to be so appropriate when you think about it <laughs> yeah so they actually don't know, like that's the scaffolding around the top yeah the building sure. the pictures that we're showing you yeah. right now um, it's the the building that has not been completed yet. We don't know what it's going to look like when it's completed. So, uh, and I love people that noted that it is scaffolding. So I, I think that the tip will look different when it's finished. Okay, um, but regardless of that, people are still taking the pictures. They're still photoshopping. You know, building sex. It's it's hilarious. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely like primed for viral, you know, fame on the internet. I mean, you know, it definitely accidents? looks like a dick. How many car accidents are going to be when people are driving <laughs> by? Like trying to take the pictures. Penis. Right. Oh, I think Hilarious. the censorship, though, is probably a bigger deal as far as, you know, China censoring everything that their people do, yeah. trying yeah. to censor these searches so that people can't see that. So on, on a more serious note, uh, in 2005, uh, g government officials in China sentenced a porn creator to life in prison. So it is a serious issue, and of course there was that whole brouhaha with uh, China and Google. They wanted to, uh, you know, ban Google because of the fact that the search engine was bringing up porn sites. And I didn't know this until today. They apparently only sell computers that filter porn in wow. China. Mm. Um, so they're very, very serious about it. It's ridiculous. Come on, if you're an adult and you want to watch porn, that's a single person's own business, no one else needs to be involved, especially the government. Now this is a perfect example of government that's too big. Um, anyway, <laughs> when we come back off their feed, our new segment where we take uh, top tweets of the week and we judge them. Hey everyone, back to The Point, and we're gonna do Off Their Feed, my favorite new segment on the show. Let's get right to it. House Speaker John Boehner tweeted this week, House votes this week to repeal Obamacare train wreck that's raising costs and hurting jobs. This will be the 37th time the House has voted to repeal Obamacare. Dave Rubin, go. How about we double the self-tanner tax and really get him to flip his lid? <laughs> Love it, does he? 37th time's the charm. Uh, I guess my tweet would be, if he were poor, who would help him if he had a flaccid boner? <laughs> <laughs> what? Wow. What? I can't make perverted jokes on the show. <laughs> All right. California Congressman George Miller says, I am pleased that H&M, Zara, and CNA just joined the fire and safety agreement for Bangladesh factories. To give you guys context into this story, after the recent horrific uh, Bangladesh factory collapse, are we going to see any genuine change when it comes to the way factory workers are treated? Desi, I'm going to start with you this time. Uh, too little, too late. H&M, you cannot buy a soul with good PR. Love it. Uh, Max. I think, I think it's, a, it's a great move, and I'm, you know, a fan of Zara. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, mind the gap. Where's the gap involved in this? Are they They doing? have not. They have declined to sign on. I'm going to uh, create a hashtag about that. Sure. Hell. All right, well, I, I would tweet, when factory workers make $38 a month, this agreement is not enough. Yeah. MSNBC tweets about Rand Paul. They say Rand Paul says Hillary Clinton doesn't deserve higher office because of what happened in Benghazi. Desi Doyen. Someone please tell the Pekingese on Rand Paul's head to stop speaking for him because it's saying stupid things again. Yeah, he doesn't deserve higher office because of his hair. Simple <laughs> as that. Well, I don't think that Rand Paul deserves higher office because of his massive flip-flop on drones. Yeah. So how about that? Daily Show head writer Tim Carville tweets, Yes, okay on Game of Thrones. Some characters fought a bear, but on Mad Men, there weren't enough chairs at a meeting. I've seen Game of Thrones, and I'm a fan of, of the, the butts. 
<laughs> you know, it's definitely got a lot of um, you, you know, like titillating, butts. titillating content. Dave Rubin. I know I shouldn't say this right here, but I've fallen asleep during every episode of Game of Thrones. I just, I tried. I love dragons. It's just not working for me. Wrong. We will censor you. <laughs> mad yeah. men are mad because they don't get full frontal nudity. Oh, that's a fair point. I will say, uh, Mad Men is stale this season. A little bit of a snooze fest, so. Really? Sorry. <laughs> David Zerota tweets, hard to believe Dems could get lucky enough to have Palin back on the national stage, but yes, they might get that lucky. Dave Rubin. Don't say Palin. We have to ignore her. I don't know, I think it sounds like a dream come true for comedians too. She's back, how can we miss her if she won't leave? Yeah, say it ain't so, Joe. <laughs> Bones actor John Daly says, I agreed to take my mom to a vegan restaurant tonight. If that isn't love, I don't know what is. I would say she cleaned up your puke when you were a kid. She changed your diapers. Going to a vegan restaurant is the least, literally, that you can do. I would say try a vegan cheeseburger. They're really, really delicious. <laughs> convincing, <laughs> very convincing. No. And you can always follow me on Twitter. Thank you so much for joining us uh, on this special episode of The Point. It was a pleasure having you, Desi Doyen, for the audience members that for some reason are not familiar with you. Uh, where can they find more of your awesome work? Uh, greennews.bradblog.com, and you can follow me on Twitter at Green News Report. All right, uh, Dave Rubin, please plug TYT Network and the awesome show you do on YouTube.com slash Rubin Report. It is a TYT Network show and uh, at Rubin Report on the Twitter. And Max, please tell us more about your upcoming show. Yeah, uh, well, the best way to uh, follow me is to find me on Twitter uh, at Max Lugavere. And the show Acting Disruptive is debuting this summer on AOL On and across the AOL universe. It's going to be amazing. I hope you all uh, tune in. All right, sounds great. I'm Anna Kasper, and you guys can check me out on The Young Turks Monday through Friday on youtube.com slash TYT Live, 6 to 8 p.m. Pacific time. And uh, of course, we love to hear your feedback. As you know, we have changed the format of the show, and we're trying to make it more appealing to you. So share your thoughts, your comments, your constructive criticism, and we'll be sure to read it. Thank you for watching The Point. We'll see you guys next week.